Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 77. Writing is the best way to talk without being interrupted. Jules Renard. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft, it's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humbled and quarantined host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And guys, I have a special treat for you. If you are interested in getting a three-part video series on screenwriting and how to write blockbusters in Hollywood today by some Oscar winners, some multi-billion dollar screenwriters, all you got to do is head over to BulletproofScreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Sign up for it there and you will get three amazing videos, almost an hour in length total in your inbox. So just head over to BulletproofScreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Now, guys, today on the show, we have Lisa Cron, who is a story coach and best-selling author of Wired for Story, the writer's guide to using brain science to hook your readers from the very first sentence. And she's also the writer of Story Genius, How to Use Brain Science to Tell Better Stories. Now, I wanted to have Lisa on because I found her books extremely, extremely interesting, and I think her approach to story is a bit unique and might help you guys on your screenwriting path. We talk about what the audience's brain is hardwired to crave in every story they read and how you can tap into this in your writing. Why writing a successful screenplay is not about having the innate talent that only a few are born with, but it's something that you can learn and how to become more confident as a screenwriter, and to make whatever you're writing deeper, richer, and more compelling. And I just loved talking to Lisa. It was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. So I want you to prepare yourself to go inside the screenwriter's mind, which is a scary, scary place. (laughs) Without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Lisa Cron. I'd like to welcome to the show Lisa Cron. How are you doing? I'm doing great, which I probably shouldn't say. (laughs) You know what? Whenever we have a great moment in this time period that we're living in now, just just own it. Own it um, because it it could last for a second. It could last for a day. Just take it when it comes. You have a point. Yes, I am doing great (laughs) at this particular moment. Yes, because it could it could go downhill very quickly, Lisa. (laughs) We we more quickly than I think we thought about a year ago. So I completely agree. I mean, uh, we were talking off air a little bit of how crazy our world is right now. And I, I, you know, like I was, I was telling you, like I, I feel like I was driving around and I saw this testing station and I just, I, I, and, and just, you look around the world right now, just literally physically just look around your neighborhood and you're just like, what is, what is going on? Like, are we in a dystopian, like, you know, spin off of the Hunger Games slash like a Blade Runner? Like, I, I don't, I, it's just such a weird, place to be in our world today i i truly believe that we are living in an alternative universe like yeah, I, I think you're right i mean i'll tell you i you know i've spent more more decades than i want to admit to reading you know manuscripts uh you know novels or or or, or scripts or memoir and especially with the scripts and with the with the novels there would always be that sort of you know strange dystopian thing going on and i would kind of think I bet that somewhere in the world this is actually happening. Only 
it actually is. Reality is almost out dystopianing <laughs> dystopian novels and scripts. It's very strange. It's a very strange world that we live in, and we as storytellers uh, have, uh, I think, a, a bigger responsibility to help heal the world and help the world through this because it is through story mm -hmm. that we process um, the. the the experience that is life without story, we, we really don't have a way to, to process it. It, it. it really does help dramatically. Would you agree? Oh yeah. I mean, the truth is we think in story, it's hardwired into our brains. I mean, we don't need a story to translate it. We automatically translate everything that happens to us into story, into narrative, you know, everything we evaluate, everything that happens to us based on, you know, one thing and one thing only. And that is how is this going to affect me given my agenda? And, and I don't mean that just in a, you know, transactional way, mm -hmm. but just literally in a, I need to feel safe. I've got what I need to do, what, you know, what I want to do, what my agenda is going forward. And is this going to get me there or is this going to stop me from getting there? And, and that doesn't necessarily, again, mean my agenda is, you know, to make a million dollars and to, you know, to, to be powerful, but just even, you know, my agenda is to try to make a more equitable world. So is this going to help me do that or is this going to hurt me to do that? And everything we make sense of, we make sense of in our lives via story because that's what contextualizes it. That's what gives it meaning. Nothing has meaning outside of the meaning that we project onto it vis-a-vis -vis our own individual story. And that's why when we're lost in a story, we're in someone else's head and we're processing information in the same way that they do, if, if that story is successful. Well, we are all the heroes in our, in our story. Oh, absolutely. We have to be. I mean, it's like, it's like that old thing of, you know, on, on back, back in the old days when we would actually fly on actual airplanes and they'd have that, you know, put your oxygen mask on first. You may remember that back in the olden days. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But that doesn't make us, bad it doesn't make us no, right. egocentric, like we're the hero but it's that in order for us to literally survive to see tomorrow we have to come first and we're biologically wired to come first in that way and i think one of the scary things is that we're wired to live in a world we don't live in anymore so that sometimes some of that gets in our way Right. I've talked a lot about the, the reptilian brain and, um, that, that kind of, that thing in the back of your head that is, uh, is there just to protect you. I've said many times on the show that the, your brain doesn't care about your dreams, doesn't care about what you want or, or want to have love or anything. It, it cares about one thing and one thing only protecting you. Yeah, that's that's apt. The only thing I would, I would say to that is they've kind of debunked the whole reptilian brain notion. Mm -hmm. It's really one thing. It's not, that's the old part. And this is the new part. No, oh, yeah. Is that, is that the way that we're wired? Yeah, is your brain when it's in fact that's the really sad thing for writers. You know, when you when you read something, and I think we've all had this experience as writers. Mm -hmm. You know, you're writing it, you think it's great, and then you read it the next morning, and you go, "Oh my god, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> like, I haven't seen this. this is, you know, and that is that part of, and you think that voice, right? We've all got that voice, and the the, the ironic thing is that voice is trying to protect us. It's like, yeah, if you put that out there, you know, but the thing you and you don't want to be laughed at. So be careful. And that voice is often wrong is, is, is the point. We, it's a, the, the point is as well that, that it's all about perspective. So your perspective of writing this piece that you're writing is either to get it sold, get it, move your career forward, tell the story that you always wanted to tell, put it out there, help other people with your story. There's multiple different perspectives or, or, or yearnings, if you will, of the writer, why they're doing what they're doing. But the brain is there for one thing and one thing only. It's to protect you from not only yourself, but from the danger that it doesn't know about. So, I always tell people like, well, when when you were when back in the day, um, mm -hmm. if you went around that corner and you've never been around that corner before, you turn that corner, your brain's going to go, "Don't go down that that corner because uh, there could be a tiger there and it could eat you." So yeah. we're always avoiding the tiger, that the potential tiger, whatever that tiger might be, could be you know maybe made a fool of people mm -hmm. rejecting you and then if you go into rejection that goes into a whole tribal thing uh in our brain as well that's why rejection is so difficult that's why people think that speaking in public is 
it's they're more fear of speaking in public than they are of death because if you speak in public and you're ousted by the audience which is almost a tribe then without the tribe you couldn't survive alone as a as a a human being back in the day there's so many different layers of things that our brain is built to to do for us but it's built for an old time like you said it's not built for the current world right no no i mean because our biggest fear is you know as you're saying turning that corner our biggest fear is the unknown and the unexpected and we're wired to to have you know what they call homeostasis meaning it's a biological term and it means once you feel safe you know, for any, for any like biological creature, once, once they're safe, you know, the temperature's right, they've got the food, they've got, you know, the space. It's not just that they want to maintain balance, but they want to maintain that balance. So anything that threatens it, mm -hmm. is terrifying. And that's, you know, the, the, the sort of colloquial term we have for that is our comfort zone. But the thing that sort of kills me is that we tend to think of these things as if we have a choice, as if, you know, our, our, our desire to stay in the comfort zone is because we're kind of weak. And if we were stronger, tougher, whatever, we would be able to go out there into the unknown. And the truth is, it is our biology that keeps us there. So it isn't to say that we can't overcome it or we can't see it for what it is. But the fact that it's difficult isn't a failing or a weakness. It's biology. The same thing, just to go a little bit deeper to what you were just saying about um, belonging to a tribe, which talk about something that we're seeing. <laughs> you, you think you think there's some tribalism going on right now? But the reason is, is that they feel that, you know, when our brains had you know, its last big growth spurt about 100,000 years ago, and, and, you know, scientists thought for a long time that that was at the time and the reason for it was that we, you know, got critical thinking. You know, we could analyze things. At, uh, analytical thought, rational thought came in at that point. And what they realize now is that the real reason for that big change is because at that time we had kind of, you know, to obviously a very, very, very minor, you know, basic degree learned to navigate successfully in the physical world. And now if we were going to do, you know, basically what we've since done, which is, you know, take over the world, we need to learn to work together well with others. And that's where the need to belong to a group became, it's hardwired. You know, people go, I'm a lone wolf. It, I always want to go, dude, there are no lone wolves, even in the wolf community. A lone <laughs> wolf in the wolf community is a wolf that's been ostracized from the pack and is left to die. Wolves travel in packs. There's no such thing as a lone wolf. But at that time, and here's the really interesting thing to go to your point, at that time, because we already had the neural pathways for physical pain, they feel that because to be ostracized from your, you know, your pack, your tribe, which at that time was obviously much smaller, thinking of Dunbar's number, probably not any bigger than 150, mm -hmm. to be ostracized meant death. So right. that social isolation, instead of your brain like creating other neural pathways for that pain, it just traveled the same pathways as regular pain traveled, meaning physical pain. So that that's why when you come up to someone and which I think a lot of us are having this experience now mm -hmm. and they got the facts wrong <laughs> and you think I'll just correct them. I'll just tell them what the correct facts are and then they'll understand and we'll be on the same page. And you, you try to correct them and often you get a screed back <laughs> and you think, Oh my God, what's wrong with you? You're such an idiot. And the truth is because when you've merely questioned their beliefs, it comes across as fighting words. You've questioned their identity and you've questioned their place within their tribe. And for them to even consider what you're saying risks that kind of social ostrac I never say this word, ostracization. 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 Yeah, I can't say it either, but yeah, yeah. I get you. Yeah, the other syllable in there for some reason. But but so so that comes across as fighting words. So it's really interesting how deeply hardwired it is. And I think it, it can understanding that can help give us empathy for other people and let us know, okay, they're not, they don't believe those ridiculous things they believe because they're stubborn or stupid or, you know, or, or just haven't done the work. It's because everything in their life has taught them that those things are true. That's what their tribe believes. So to even consider something else, it takes a massive amount of, 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 of courage. No, absolutely. If you're in, 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 uh, you know, if you're in a family, uh, that is super religious and you come out to be gay, um, in, in a community that doesn't like, you know, doesn't approve of that, um, that becomes an issue. Uh, and okay. you have to become so strong to break free from that tribe. Um, and, and just stand on your own two feet. And that could be as simple as, Hey, I'm going to go be a writer and your, your parents are a, a lawyer and a doctor. Like, no, you're not. 
you're oh, you're yeah. you're going to law school. And, <laughs> And you're like, no. And it's like, that's, that's another example of it. Um, mm-hmm. and, and to go back to what we were talking about earlier, as far as mm-hmm. the unknown, a lot of, a lot of times people think, well, around the corner, there's that tiger. That tiger could be positive or negative. It doesn't have to be danger. It mm-hmm. could be something it's not accustomed yeah. to. The, so yeah. if, if you, and I've had this experience myself, when you, if you have a, and this is a great character. By the way, this is a free character trait that you can use for your characters, guys listening. Um, when you when you have a character who meets someone who's obviously – like if you have a girl who meets the good guy, that, mm-hmm. that good guy who treats her well and treats her nice and he's a good-looking dude and everything. If she's never been treated right or for like if he has never been treated right in a relationship, it will be completely scary to be with someone like that. Either way, opposite or or you know for the for someone who takes care of you or abuses you, that's and and a lot of times they self sabotage a relationship because oh, oh, the, yeah. things are too good here. I don't like this. This is completely unknown territory. I'm going to sabotage it, and it does it. They do, they do it on a subconscious level. It's not like they sit there and go, "I'm going to sabotage this relationship." They just start doing things that know they know that they'll sabotage. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, a hundred percent. That's what people don't realize is that all change is hard and good change is as hard as bad change. And Mm -hmm. we don't necessarily assume that. And when we stick with our comfort zone, what that really means is the familiar. And you're right. I mean, there are a lot of people who would rather be with someone who is very difficult to be with because they know how to do that. (laughs) It's reliable. It's, it's, it's the known, it's the, it's like they say, the devil, you know. Right, that's uh, why we stay stick with the devil, you know. But I would say that in a story, if somebody is going to do that, that's a what. You know, a- any kind of a trait is a what. And what you want to get to in order to earn that trait and give it meaning is the why. In other words, what happened in that person's life probably early on that caused them to misread when, you know, when someone is, is, is nice to them, for instance, can I give you a quick, for instance, sure, of course. An example I use a lot, because what I, I call this, the misbelief, the characters come into a story with a misbelief, something that they believe about human nature that they learned when they were very young, that's kept them from getting what they want, probably from an early age, up until the moment we are going to shove them onto the screen. And now they're going to have to go after what they want, but overcome this misbelief in order to get it. So let's imagine that, because I, I use that example a lot, it, it, the example of, and I would say, I, I would I would sum up what you said is that somebody's misbelief might be the nicer someone is to me. And the more they want to get to know me, the more they really only want to use and abuse and manipulate me. That's why they're doing it. And so something like that might come in. I'll give you a very quick example. Like imagine that protagonist, let's say, is going to be a, a 29-year-old woman. But when she's nine years old, she comes from a, a very dysfunctional family. I, I don't know what a functional family is. I don't know if there are any. But this there, so there might be. There, there's a couple. I mean, we're all hey, – l- listen, I'm trying to create a functional family. But obviously, in my perspective, I'm the hero, dad. So you know, my daughters will probably tell me something differently in 20 years. I don't know. There's always something. There's always something. <laughs> like, and then you go, I never said that. No, who and I didn't said that? mean that. Of course, exactly. <laughs> but anyway, so mentioning this girl, she's nine. She's, you know, she comes from, has a single mom. She has a feral sister and she's nine years old. And she feels like no one ever pays any attention to her. Like she's just lost. And so at school, all the girls have decided to get together and form this club around this little Japanese anime character. And to get into the club, which they're about to form, you have to have you know a doll of this character. And she thinks, okay, great. I can save up my money. I can save up my allowance. I can get it. These, these girls are my people. I will be able to do it. So she saves her money and she finally has enough. The day before, they're about to do it the next day. She opens her bank and moths come out it's nothing it's gone and she's bereft it's like it's all is lost there's no way out at all she's sobbing and about an hour later her older sister comes in and says you know i know we don't talk but but seeing you so sad i've asked around i know what's going on i know about that club at school and you saved all your money and it you know it's somehow it's gone and it broke my i broke my heart i i couldn't stand to to see you sobbing like that so i took my money and i went out and i got to an even bigger version of the doll now at this point you know our protagonist is thinking oh my god i don't need those girls anymore this is great she saw me i didn't have to even ask she got to know me she knew what i wanted she went and got it for me without asking and i mean truly isn't that what we on one level all want more than anything is somebody to anticipate what we need and give it to us 
before we even have to ask. I mean, that's just, I can't yeah, think. Yeah, very, oh, it's very genie-like. Yes, exactly. So, so, but at that point, the sister goes, but you know, I used all my money to buy it and I'm going out with Ralph tonight. And if I don't pay, he's going to dump me. And mom hasn't given me my allowance since I crashed the car. And you know, that's not my fault. And she's got that hundred dollar bill in her purse. And I, if you could just distract her, you're so cute. All I want you to do that. I know that the, the money's for food, but I'm not hungry. Are you? I'll just take it in. And in that moment, that character has an aha moment which is, wait a minute, she's thinking, you didn't do that to be kind to me. You you probably, in fact, stole my money. And you're just doing it because you want me to help you steal. You're trying to use me. Now, in that moment, that belief is true. That is probably what she was doing. And in fact, our protagonist could look back to other things earlier and go, oh, yeah, I, now that all makes and so that belief, the nicer she is to me, the more she seems to want to get to know me, the more she's only going to use and abuse me, that was adaptive in that moment. It probably mm -hmm. helped her survive in that family. And the reason these kind of misbeliefs tend to come in when we're young is because when we're older, if someone came up and, you know, a similar thing where you, you meet someone and they're finishing, you're finishing each other's sentences soon and you feel like, oh, this person knows me, we've got such simpatico, and then they go, you know that money you've got? I'm starting this Ponzi scheme. And would you like to invest? And at that moment you go, oh my God, this person is a jerk. I know a lot of other nice people. I'm just going to get this person out of my life. Mm -hmm. When you're nine, it's not my sister's a jerk. It's, oh, this is how people are. Yeah. People are jerks. I have to be careful. And so that misbelief would have grown, escalated, and complicated up to the point in exactly to use. It's amazing that you use that example because it just matches exactly you know, this, this story that I just happen to have on the, on the tip of my tongue because I use it all the time. But that would explain. And so that's why when you're thinking of, you know, what your character might do, your protagonist, what kind of, you know, quirk or belief or desire or misbelief they've got, it really pays to go back and, and not just get the what, but the why. Because the why is what your story is going to be about. Your why is about, I mean, that's what stories are about. My son actually is, is a producer. We we're talking about a movie that they were, that they were uh, uh, give, giving notes on to, to, to the writer about a year or so ago, talking, you know, making movies. And, um, you know, and he said, yeah, he said, because the, the story present is what makes the unconscious conscious. And that's the whole point. By the time the story starts, this misbelief has become the lens through which the character is evaluating everything that's happening, just, just like we all do. Does this make me safe or doesn't it? And so what happens in the story forces that character to reevaluate that. It brings it back to the surface, not that they're thinking it, you know, like a bumper sticker, but because it's been incorporated into how they're making the decisions that they're making. And that's what we're watching. I did an episode a while ago called Why We're, Why Screenwriters Are Programmed to Fail. Um, and it was an entire episode dis basically discussing similar concepts of what we're talking about now. And, and I used an example of, um, why, why the rich get rich and stay rich and the poor stay poor and stay poor. And it's because of, and I've, I've, I've studied this to my knowledge. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts sure. on it. When, when, how many rich people have you met in your life? You're going, these guys are an absolute, idiot. this guy's an idiot. How has he failed up? How is, how is it, how is this possible? How does he keep making money when he has no foreseeable skill? Um, and he's, he's a moron in so many other places, but yet he keeps able to make money. And it's not because daddy or mommy is helping him. It's just because he's kind of programmed. To know what to do. And then why is this person who was born into a poor scenario who's really smart but yet has blocks where they can't generate more revenue or more money in their life? And I'm using money as an example here. Um, then, then their parents did. And it's because that we as, as children – we absorb it. Like you were just saying, it's not just my sister did that. It's all people did that. Right. So when you're a child and you're born into a millionaire family or something or a billionaire family, everyone just does what they, they start absorbing everything that they see their parents do on a subconscious level. So when they get to the, to the age of 
to generate revenue. They just already kind of know what to do because they've been doing it. It's the same thing for a family who's born into a family of acrobats or mm-hmm. circ- or circus folk or filmmakers. I mean, look how many uh, Bryce mm-hmm. Bryce Dallas Howard is becoming a director now. I wonder how that happened. You yeah. know, I mean, she's Ron Howard's kid. I mean, she was on sets all the time uh, when they were growing up. So it, they kind of absorb these things. Um, do you, do you feel that, I mean, and again, going back to character, that's a really interesting kind of way to look at a character as well, because it depends on what their, what their upbringing is. And based on that upbringing, um, they have certain blocks that they just can't get through until they consciously break through. So, mm-hmm. you know, like I've heard poor people mentality, uh, which I've, Unfortunately, I'm a card carrying member many times in my life of thinking like you got to do this or you got to do that. Um, and, and you got to do this and that where someone who was, who was raised in a different environment has completely different beliefs about money where I might have had beliefs about money because that's the way my grandpa worked hard all his life. And his, his definition of, of success is getting a job and, and, and working hard as opposed to, Someone raised in another scenario is like, no, it's about money working hard for you and you not working that hard. Um, it's, you know, it's different. So I'd just love to hear what you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, the only thing I would say about that particular analogy, and this goes to, you know, creating characters as well, is that, um, you know, so often, I mean, I, I guess, you know, part of it is like so on all of our minds right now is that there's also, I mean, if you're, if you're born into a wealthy white family, mm-hmm. <laughs> one particular person at the moment, um, you know, you have weight and it's not just what your parents, you know, the way that they saw things, but it's also that you're, that you're white. Oh, there's privilege. Absolutely. There's privilege. I mean, yeah. So, so for a lot of people who are poor, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I mean, I think the best example of that is the fourth season of the wire, I think, which oh, is a a marvel. Um, an what a great show. Job. Yeah, it was, it was so good, but it did an amazing job of really showing if you're born into poverty and you're born into, you know, systemic racism, which is what we're talking about a lot now, no matter what you do, it is just impossible. You just, there, there are no other options. And I think that that, that's what can make a much more interesting story than somebody just, you know, suddenly finding, uh, you know, rags to riches because they've got the gumption or whatever to do it, but more what happens to people who would have had, had that, but have no, no matter what they do, the opportunity either slams in their face or, or turns for something that, you know, is, is of no fault of their own. Um, but yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think that's what all stories are about. All stories are about an internal change. The big mistake that, um, the big mistake that writers make and screenwriters kind of in, in particular, um, I, mean, I can't tell you when I was reading screenplays and I spent decades reading screenplays, I can't, it was almost like every screenplay I read, I would think, okay, wait a minute. No, this is the person who's never seen a movie. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's this person who's never seen a movie. 10,000 people, but it was this one because it looks easy, you know, like 120 pages and all that white space. How hard could it be? I mean, it's I mean, super, and I've seen movies, so I mean, I, I should be able to write one. It's kind of like I, I listen to Mozart. I should yeah. <laughs> should be able to write a song. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's so hard, but it's not about any story. It's not about the plot. It's not about the things that happen. It's about how the things that happen affect someone and affect an internal change. That is what stories are about. That's what roots us. What roots us isn't big giant things blowing up one way or another. It's what those things blowing up, what, how and what that's going to affect someone and not just affect them in general. Like, well, yeah, if your building blows up and you're inside it, you're in trouble. <laughs> I mean, that's well, the there's, there's that. <laughs> right. There is that. But it's, it's why things matter. It's like, to give you a very quick example, it's like the movie Die Hard, which, um, mm. which I Fabulous movie. I, I, I did an entire episode uh, Christmas explaining why it's the greatest Christmas movie of all time. So um, we are so uh, on the same page. <laughs> oh, we're on the same page. It's it's it's, it's arguably one of my top five. It's on my top five yeah. uh, action I, films of all time. I, I agree. I could not agree with you more. But 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 what Die Hard is about? It's not about you know is Bruce Willis going to kill the pseudo bad guys? You know the pseudo terrorists. Yeah. 
it's it's about is Bruce Willis, and it's not even about people who go, well, it's about is Bruce Willis going to save his wife? And it's not about that either. It's about is Bruce Willis going to be able to win his wife back? She's left him. Is he going to be able to win her? Now, of course, I mean, obviously, he's got to, he wants to save her as well because, he, you know, he doesn't want to win her back in a body bag. That would be a Pyrrhic victory if ever mm-hmm. there was. <laughs> but that's what, and that's why we care. That's what's pulling us all the way through. It's not just, you know, is he going to kill Hans Gruber, which, I mean, Alan Rickman, a moment of silence for his passing. Oh, but- rest in peace, my friend. Oh, what's well, so, it's so, such a great actor, but that character alone. No. Like, for people listening, like, you have to understand, I saw Die Hard in the theater uh, when I was a teenager. Mm-hmm. And, and can you imagine walking into, like, oh, isn't that that guy from Moonlighting? Um, yeah. Let me go, let me go watch this. There's something blowing up. Let me go watch it. And you walk out going, what did I yeah. just see? Yeah. It's a perfect movie. I mean, it, 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 it's so perfect, but the thing that's amazing for people that don't understand it, it created a genre of film. It's Die Hard on a Boat, Die Hard on a Train, Die Hard in, a, in, a, in an, an arena, Die Hard everywhere. Because it was, But the difference between all of those movies mm-hmm. and Die Hard is exactly what you're saying. Is this? It's not about what's on the surface. Yes, that's all cool. And yes, that he's very vulnerable. He's wearing no shoes. Um, you know, he's the everyman. There's like, there's so many things that make McLean such a wonderful character. But you're right. It's about, is there, are they going to get back together? And it's, and it's subtle. It's not a, he- it's not heavy handed. It's subtle. I mean, in the same way that, um, in the same way that the Hunger Games trilogy is about, are, are, are Katniss and Peter going to get together? I mean, in the beginning, is, is she going to realize he likes her and is she going to have to kill him? And that's what really is pulling us through all three books, which I think are fabulous. I think even the movies were good. I, 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 I devoured those. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's a human story. That's what we care about. We don't care about the other. And well, without that, you just have a, what, what most, what most screenplays and most, you know, novel, what most manuscripts are is honestly nothing but a bunch of things that happen. That's, well, that's. Damn yeah, it's very it's very superficial, um, without question. So, like a movie like Lethal Weapon, which is also on my top five of all time, um, uh, you know, do we care? Why why do you care about Murdoch and Riggs? It's like, well, is Riggs gonna be a? Is he gonna not kill himself by the end of this thing? <laughs> like you're you're holding on to to that, um, and then and the combination of those two together is just such a magical thing. But what is your what is your what is your take on the the reason why Lethal Weapon? If you watch it, and Shane Black's a lot of Shane Black's scripts have this have this this kind of underlining emotional tug. I mean, I can't. I, I saw it. I saw it when it came out so long ago mm-hmm. that I, I couldn't talk to it other than to agree with you that um, you know any movie we're pulled into that we care about, it's because we care about the characters, but not just care about them in the situation that they find themselves in, but what being in that situation is going to mean to them, given what they walked onto the you know onto into scene one um, already wanting. I mean, and and that goes to what you just said. Yeah, is he really going to kill himself? Well, that was something, if he is or isn't, that was something he already wanted to do before he walked onto the screen. So it always, I mean, I mean, what I am always saying to writers is, is that all stories begin in medias res. And I don't mean it, 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 it's funny, the first time I heard that term was as a screenwriting term, and it, which means it's a, it's a Latin, it's Latin, and mm-hmm. it means in the middle of the thing. And, and in screenwriting, it tended to be meant, you know, if you're going to start a scene, start in the middle, right? You, you start at that moment right. where if you wait one more minute, it'll be too late. And if you start too early, people are going to get bored. But that's not what it really means. What it really means is all stories begin in media stress, meaning literally the first scene of the movie or the first page of the novel is the first scene or page of the second half of the story. The backstory is the most crucial and important layer of story. Without it, you have no story. And I think the biggest problem that writers have is that they'll start on page one and think they have to read forward. Or, and I'm going to say something now that probably, especially in the film community, is going to sound really, <laughs> really incendiary. And it is mm-hmm. incendiary both literally and figuratively. If it was up to me, I would burn every copy of the hero's journey or the <laughs> Vogler book or save the cat or any of those books, because they claim to be about story structure. And that's a misnomer. They're about plot structure. And the story is not 
about the plot and the lie in those books, besides the fact that things don't always happen in the order that they do, or God forbid, with the hero's journey, which I particularly detest, you know, we have to have the temptress. It just, I just, my blood is boiling. I've got to take a deep breath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But it's not about the plot. And the lie in those books is when they give you examples, they give you examples of movies and books you are familiar with. And so when you think of those plots, you're already supplying that that emotional internal tug of the struggle that the character is going through. So you go, okay, yeah, this has to happen at the end of act one. And now here's the act two climax. And now here's, and so writers are writing things from the outside in. And story structure is organic. It's, it's inside out. Story structure is, is the byproduct of a story well told, not something you can plan as you begin to write the story. And I think that's what tanks so many scripts and so many manuscripts is that they're looking at, well, now I need a character who's going to be the one who's going to mention what, what, what the character needs to do. So let me put that in there. And now I need something really big to happen here because that's the mid act climax. And then they'll turn and they'll reach into this external grab bag of, of, of supposedly dramatic things and throw something in as opposed to no story is a complete cause and effect trajectory that began usually with, with, with what I call the, the, the protagonist's origin story, the moment where that misbelief was born and it's cause and effect from beginning to end. If you can do one of those, those card things, you know, where they, where you go, you know, write the scenes on cards and move them around. If you mm-hmm. can move them around, you don't have a story. It's cause and effect. You can't move them around. Story is, Again, 100% cause and effect. This happened, wait, therefore that. This happened, but that. Um, anyway, so. Well, so uh, we were talking a little bit. Uh, to, to, I, I, by the way, I, it, I, it's, it, I love bringing people on the show that have different perspectives because I've had every one of those people that you've talked, I've had them on on the show. Um, and they all have different perspectives on story. And well, I think I'm going to interrupt you there one second. And this is where I do not play well with others. I think they're wrong. I, and that's fine. And that's fine. And you're completely, and, and there's points that you've made that make absolutely all the sense in the world. Um, and, and nor will I try to debate you on it because I, I don't have a strong, I don't have a strong affiliation either way. Yeah. But I, I always love bringing different perspectives of story because you never know what, what's going to click with a certain writer. True. Um, true. It, it's, you know, like I, I believed, you know, like early on in my, in my, in my writing career, mm-hmm. you know, the hero's journey and, and, and that whole process. And then I had John Truby on mm-hmm. and then John Truby goes, you can throw the hero's journey on a detective story. Let me know how that works out for you. Mm-hmm. And my mind exploded. I was like, what, wait a minute, but all stories are the hero's journey. I'm like, no, 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 not all of them. Um, and you're like, oh, okay. That's, that's okay. All right then, and then it just starts changing the way you look at things. So I completely, uh, I, I completely uh, understand your point of view. No question about it. Now, what, the one thing that we were talking about earlier about the 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 uh, the backstory of the character isn't it interesting that a character who was in cinema forever, named James Bond, who basically didn't have a true backstory. He was just kind of like he was very one dimensional. He never changed. He he was not a, a character that changed from beginning to end of every story. He was basically James Bond at the beginning, at the end. But when Casino Royale showed up and they gave him backstory and they gave him all these other things that drove him to be who he is, it became honestly the best Bond film ever made, in my opinion. Would you agree? Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, 100 percent. I think the reason, though, yes, 100 percent. I think without backstory, it's very easy for something to become a bunch of things that happened. I think things like James Bond, the world was changing then. Cinema movies were changing at that point. And so we were seeing things that were new anyway, so people could get away with other stuff and not go as deep. As, as they can now not be willing to do it. And I think that with mysteries, because people will say the same thing about, well, what about Sherlock Holmes or, you yeah. know, uh, other detectives? What about Perot or what about, you know, um, Philip Marlowe? And I think that the answer there is that mysteries themselves are always about not just who done it, but in order to know who, you got to know why. And we come to story. I mean, I think, I think we come to story for, for, for exactly the reason that in the beginning of Citizen Kane, you know, where you've got the, the newsreel director going, nothing's more interesting than finding out what makes people tick. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, 
that's what we come for. So if we're going to get a detective who isn't going to change, that person is looking and evaluating what's going on based on trying to figure out what made you know the murderer or whatever, whoever the person is, do what they do. And then the cleverness of trying to figure out, okay, here's a really hard thing. How could you possibly make that happen? And if you notice, and I can't give you an example of this because we're just, I'm just talking off the, off the top of my head, but it's something I say to writers all the time is that it's never just some logistic cleverness. There must be blood. And I'm not talking about the movie, Mm -hmm. but there must be blood. In other words, whatever's happening, whatever the person believes, whatever they're doing, it, it isn't just a factual thing. It's something that is going to, in some very human way, hurt or help someone else in terms of getting something that they really, really want or are afraid of it always comes back to that meaning always comes back to how it's going to affect someone emotionally and i don't mean that in a pejorative sense at all i think as a as i was saying to you before we started i mean emotion is such a deeply misunderstood um biological system i think we purposely misunderstand it not just in our culture but around the world because every decision we ever make is driven by emotion and that's positive. If we didn't feel emotion, we couldn't make a single rational decision. Emotion, it's not just emotion. It's obviously emotion and, and reason. We've been taught that they're, that they're opposite. They're binary, right? It's either mm-hmm. emotion or reason. And the truth is they work together. And the truth is the driver is emotion, not reason. No matter, no matter how we always think, oh, I'm a master of my own ship. It makes you feel so safe. It makes you feel so secure but whatever decision you make you don't make because of it's the rational argument you make that decision because of how the rational argument makes you feel it always comes back to feeling and so in a story if there isn't that in other words if we're not in the character skin as they're feeling something we we jump ship yeah I've, out. no I've, I've seen movies as well that I, I, I call it kind of intellectual writing versus emotional writing where you could just see that the writer is trying to be cool and right. trying to be trying to be clever and look how look how m- much prowess I have over the craft that I can do this yeah. this and this but you feel nothing and it's annoying too yes you do yes. you feel annoyed at the writer you think you think you're so full of yourself it's like ha you're annoying me go away yeah yeah right yeah. It, it's like look how cool I am look it's like kind of like writing when you have your, I'm sure you've read a screenplay that has seventy five cent words in it constantly oh yeah oh. Oh, yeah. I worked once oh, with a, uh, a lawyer who was writing a novel, and he said – he's a trial lawyer. <laughs> he said, I learned in my career, the bigger the word, the less emotion it conveys. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. The last thing you want to use are, are $25 words, let alone $75 words. The simplest words are, are usually the most powerful if there's meaning behind them. In other words, it, the words in themselves are nothing. It's the meaning they're conveying, and that's what comes from the story. And that almost always comes from from backstory, because backstory is what is what is what uh, creates again the lens and the meaning that your protagonist is reading into it. Because just one thing, really quickly, I just finished reading a a, a book. Um, it's literally called "Your Brain Is a Time Machine" by a neuroscience. So I think he's, he's I think he's out of L.A. And he says basically, and of course, all of the research um, you can find this all over. But he says, you know, the sole purpose of your brain is to record past memories in order to predict the future. So in other words, if Ooh, you have a character with no backstory, how can they, uh, what do they have at stake? Oh, What's, that's powerful. That's what, so powerful. It? Yeah. I mean, and, and again, when you're writing a character, a character's a person like you or me, and that's what we do. And that's, I mean, I could go into the whole neuroscience behind it, but <laughs> so well, I, which we might in a second, cause I'm a neuroscience nerd um, yeah. as well. But, um, uh, okay, now my, my, my neural science now is already – I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> All the time. It's, it's so funny when you do it in the middle of talking. I yeah. done that. Where was I going? Where was I going? It's like, no, there's too many ideas flying into my head right now. Um, to, uh, then I know we're going to talk about something. I want to talk about something really quickly that I know is going to divide our audience, um, which is great. Uh, it's the uh, Marvel movies. Um <laughs> Now, you were talking about emotion, and I'm right. gonna. Uh, you watch a movie like Avengers Endgame, and generally, what Marvel has done throughout their ten years of putting what they've done is unprecedented. How they've created so much 
Um, and by the way, I think those whole all those movies are emotion delivery systems. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you like them or not, and you can tell me in a second. I'm, I'm going to tell you from my point of view, who is a fan. Um, I have been a comic book fan for a long time. And when you get to Endgame, by the way, spoiler alert, guys, if you have not seen Endgame, it's not my fault. Um, <laughs> made a, it made like $3 billion. I'm sorry. If you haven't seen it, I, you can't blame me. But at the end, when um, Iron Man does that ultimate sacrifice and you see him go, there is so much emotion. Um, and if you, and you watch like when they're like at the, the moment where they're about to, the Thanos is about to, um, destroy them. And like, it's only like three of them is Iron Man, uh, mm-hmm. Thor and, and, um, Captain America. Um, uh, then, then everybody starts coming out of those, you know, magical Dr. Strange circles. I've heard the reaction. I was in the theater, but I also watched them online. The people lost their mind. And the reason why they lost their mind was that because it was 10 years of emotional, um, emotional context or, or, or connection with all of these characters coming out. And you're like, all of them are coming out at once together. It was just such an emotional thing for me watching it and i've seen it obviously it hit a chord with somebody because if it was just blowing stuff up then you would have the dc universe um <laughs> which yeah. is the yeah, justice league and how that was a complete failure we'll see what the schneider cut says when it comes out um <laughs> on hbo max but it was a complete failure because there was no backstory there was no emotion um at all uh, what do you? I don't know how much you know about or are into the comic book films, but I think it's it's it, since they are the most popular form of entertainment right now in the in the, in the industry, it's 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 not, it's not a bad conversation to have. Yeah, no, and and I, to be completely honest, I am not a I'm not a fan. So okay. I've not seen I've not seen I've not seen any of them. I mean, maybe mm-hmm. one or two. But okay. I mean, just comment. I mean, just even <laughs> when you're invested in characters, like you said, ten years of them, and and I mean, you know their backstory at that point, whether you know whether it's ever been been stated on the screen or not, because you watched it. Right. So you have that. I mean, it's funny. Um, you know, I said before about you know the fourth season of The Wire. The fifth season of The Wire, which was, I think, only a half a season, it was dreadful. Mm-hmm. It didn't matter. I watched every minute of it because I loved the characters. I would have watched anything. You know, at that point, you're so deeply invested that it's like, yes, just keep going. I mean, if it, you know, just, just, I just want to watch them getting into character. I, I'll watch anything. It doesn't matter. Because you love, because you love those characters. Like that, and, but that's the, that's kind of something very interesting with, with, um, um, with television now, because now we, we binge so much. Uh, Like when I I saw the, I I binged the wire, watched the whole series. And once you go down the road, you're in three, four seasons, unless they do something super crazy, you're pretty much in. Um, you know, like I was, I watched the walking dead probably about six seasons in maybe. And then the, when it turned for me, I don't know if you've ever watched the walking dead, but when it turned to me is they had this one villain um, that came in and he was so abusive to my characters that I loved and they and never gave those characters a moment of victory. Like there was the whole season. It was just like someone was beating up on my characters constantly. It was never a going back and forth kind of fight. It was just kind of like a pummeling. Mm-hmm. And that's the problem with like when you have a villain that's so overpowering, it's not fun anymore. I don't want to see my characters, my favorite characters get beat up. I stopped watching because the, it, it, they they just went too far. They could have still had a very powerful uh, pro- mm-hmm. antagonist, but yet give give some vic- small victory, something. Yeah. Um, and by the time that victory came, it was too late. I was already lost. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I stopped. I watched, I think, the first three seasons of it, and I can't remember why. I think I just bailed because I guess it was just – I just got tired of watching people eat people or whatever. If you don't like the eating, it's probably yeah. not a good thing yeah, to watch. Yeah, to be I admit to not being either a horror fan either. So it was like I, – I am surprised, and it's a testament to the show that I lasted that long because it isn't you know usually what I like. But for something to be a horror, it's got to be something like Get Out or something that's just so good that – you know, I'm completely willing to stay, to stay hooked. And, you know, I mean, everybody's got their, I guess their preference again, probably comes back to, for me, I, I, and I'll tell you this, literally, I don't understand. I don't understand why people love 
watching horror movies because I can't imagine getting off watching somebody get hurt. I have a hard time with cop things sometimes. Um, cop things I'm never going to watch again. <laughs> I've talked to somebody that- watching. Bosch, when all this happened, it's like, I'm never watching another cop show ever again. I'm but done. Bosch is so good. I, yeah. It's yeah. so good. <laughs> Halfway through the season when, when, you know, when, uh, when George Floyd died and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I've just, I could yeah. I literally, it was interesting. I literally, you know, we, we watched one, one, one episode after it was like, I absolutely can't do this. I just can't do this. And I just, well, I mean, like they canceled cops for God's sakes. Um, I know. and, and that's 32 years and all, I mean, and how many cop shows are on television, like blue bloods and, and, uh, you know, LA uh, law and order. You can kind of, it's more of a, but yeah, but law and order and SVU unit, like uh, there's, Everything's a cop show. Yeah, so it's got built in drama, you know, by uh, definition. It, it's automatically build. built yeah. in drama. So like Chicago PD and all of those things, I, I, how is it, how are they going to come back? Like, I, I'm assuming of it, look, we're going to see a cop show again. We're going to see cops on the movies again. I, I just don't know. It'll be different. Hopefully it'll be different. Like I you mean, can't release Lethal Weapon today. You I know. know. Like a, that, like you know, the rogue, the rogue cop doing it, playing by their own rules. That's pretty much the eighties. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, even with, I mean, it, try, you know, talking about the way things change, moving away from cop movies for a minute. Try watching old John Hughes movies. You can't. There's, there's misogynist. They're racist. It's there, like there's, there's know. definitely some rough. There's some rough stuff in the old. I haven't yeah. watched. I haven't watched the John Hughes. I mean, other than. um Home Alone, um, but like if you watch him, I haven't seen Breakfast Club. I don't remember there being Breakfast Club isn't so bad. I'm yeah, I was gonna say I don't remember Breakfast Club, but I know like Pretty in Pink. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Pink is com- one that doesn't. Sixteen Candles, forget it. Oh my god, it's <laughs> that I remember. Like even then, I was like, dude, that that seems a little. <laughs> <laughs> so many. It was just. It was. It, it's yeah. a. It's a weird. Like yeah, but and now they were pulling movies off. Like they pulled off. Um, well, they pulled off Gone with the Wind, obviously, for, right. for, for, for obvious reasons. But there was, they made a, a disclaimer on aliens, on aliens because of, um, uh, oh God, what's her name? Is it Marquez? What's her name? Uh, the, the actress who played the Latina, no, um, Ma- Marine, but mm-hmm. she was, but she's not Latina. Um, she's, she also played like, you know, an Irish, uh, Irish peasant in Titanic. So, um, and they were like, they had to warn about that. I was like, well, you know, at a certain point, like, I don't know. I don't want to stand on one side or the other of something like that. But it's getting to that place now that we're, we're going yeah. back and there has to be some social context because th- things, some things do not age. Um, I hate to say it, birth of a nation does not age well. Oh, age well? Oh my God. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> you know? It well, it was, it was, it, it didn't age well when it came out. Um, right. But but it there's hard. I, I mean, mean look, hey, look remember John look remember John Wayne you know what what was this famous line a good Indian is a dead Indian like that's you can't yeah. say things like that anymore yeah. and you never should have been it is hard though I mean I I think that we'll have a reckoning going forward because I mean I I yeah it's it is really really hard because I think part of it. Part of it, I mean, think about it for one second. I mean, I mean, well, first of all, as we can see, the world has changed in 200 years massively. Mm-hmm. So that if this was, if we didn't have film and or social media or, or the internet, right? It was just even books. Whatever was done or written before would be pretty much forgotten. But because we have film and social media, <laughs> that's going to pull up anything anybody said 30 years ago and suddenly here it is. It all, everything always stays current. And so it's hard. And I'll tell you, I had my own, when I wrote the first book I wrote, Wired for Story, and I wanted to give an example of, um, okay, here's a story and here's going to show a word I would never use again, theme. I don't believe in theme at all anymore, but theme and plot and I forget what the third thing was. And I wanted to find an example I could give that that I thought, okay, everybody's going to know this. I can't pick something that you know, I've read, but no one else has. And so I did research and I picked Gone with the Wind. And mm-hmm. so I talk about Gone with the Wind just solely about, you know, the plot and what it's about, et cetera, and about two or three pages. And I've gotten, I got an email yesterday from someone saying, you need to pull that out. You know, you're promoting white supremacy. How can you do that? Right. You know, pull it out. And it's like, I want to go, I, 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 if I could, if I, I pull a whole chapter out actually, because I would rewrite it. Mm-hmm. 
but but you don't know it's 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 hard to say. I see I'm stuttering right now. Yeah, I didn't think of that. It didn't occur to but me. But it wasn't but it wasn't something that was, you know, no, culturally no, it wasn't it wasn't culturally there and it, it's but it's still hard, but it was so <sighs> it never occurred to me and going back to the yeah, it didn't know, occur to anybody. I mean, it's it's, it's very it, unless you were black and then it probably did. That's the point. Right, 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 exactly. And that's the problem that that, that everyone's protesting and, and walking the streets about and now. I mean, we're all, you know, I'm just reading now how to be an anti-racist. It's there, there's so I mean, again, the same thing is true of of the one that I happen to think is the last, although we have been talking about it in big ways in the past couple of years, but the last acceptable bias, which is misogyny. Uh, you know, I think I think that, that that's everywhere. Oh. I mean, uh, I, I had I had um, um, Na, uh, Naomi McDougal Jones who wrote this amazing book. She's a female filmmaker uh, and writer, and she wrote this amazing book. Uh, I forgot the name of the book because I, I haven't released the episode yet. But it's about how how Hollywood is completely screwed over women, basically. It, yeah. and, the, and she talks about the entire history of Hollywood, and she lays out like every female dir- director who's been who's won an Oscar or been nominated for an Oscar is either, and I couldn't believe this is either a, a married or was married to a powerful man and, or was a fa- was a, a, a sibling, a sibling or um, a child or a child of a powerful male. Wow. So we were just talking about Bryce Dallas Howard, yeah. um, Sophia Coppola. Um, um, oh God, what's her name? Oh God. The, the director of point break. Zero to Dark Thirty. Um, oh, 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 oh! I can't, I can't get it. <laughs> but you know, she was, she's. Um, I can't believe I can't. Remember. Catherine Bigelow, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Catherine Bigelow was the ex of James Cameron, you know, and right. you know, I heard, I heard, you know, would have she would have never been able to get a movie like Point Break off the ground without James Cameron as a co-producer back in the eight, late eighties, early nineties. Yeah. You know, she was more than talented enough to do it. So it was fascinating to watch, and then she starts going into. Um, which is so fascinating, and you start thinking about it, like how many characters are on screen, uh, female characters who don't talk about men, who oh, right. don't talk right. about sex, who don't show themselves as sexual objects, like, and you start dwid- dwizzling down those things to the point where, like, right. it's a, it's like three percent of females talking to other females about things that are other than men and sex. Right. The big tell rule, I think it's called. Yeah, <laughs> I think she she mentioned that. that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it and, was and it's very. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I've this is a bad thing to say here. I suppose I literally stopped watching most movies. I won't watch a movie if it's just about men. I just won't. It's like mm-hmm. I don't care. I don't want to see things from the male gaze. I don't want to see. I just. I've got. I've spent my entire life. I'm full to the brim with it. You know, it's just enough. So you know, I I I I completely understand. I think that's why it's so important for writers and um, filmmakers of different backgrounds, of different ethnicities, of different sexes to come out and tell their stories from their point of view. It's so so Mm -hmm. so important to have that um, because it has been, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, has been white dominated, white male dominated for the history um, of Hollywood, and it's not. Hollywood that did that, that's just a reflection of society. Right, exactly. Yes, no, everything is just a reflection of what there is. That is the whole point. As we were saying before, to take it back to a granular level, each of us reflects where we came from and the culture from which we came in. That's our tribe. And we tend to think the problem is we tend to think, well, that's the way the world is and that's the way the world's always been without going, no, wait a minute, that's just the way my family is or my world is. And then we reflect it back. So it makes total sense. Yeah, it's not Hollywood didn't get together and conspire on that level. That's the way the world was. And they were just presenting it as it was and acting as it was. And there's so many, I'll tell you one real interesting, just a quick little tidbit that just goes back to just even technically how it's this way. And I'm going to mangle this because the one thing I sort of suck at is getting like technical details exactly right. Mm-hmm. But I was listening to a podcast talking about the beginning of radio, like literally when they could first transmit in anything in radio and the pitch that they, the bandwidth that they used was what reflected the male voice and the female voice, which had a different pitch came across very shrill. 
And that had a lot to do, it was purposeful, actually. And it had a lot to do with why the male voice, once we could hear a male voice or any voice, you know, other than just somebody standing in front of you talking, you know, became the voice of reason and the voice that we that we pay attention to and listen to because we're wired, you know, we're wired to hear a voice and to feel like that voice is talking to us, even if it's talking to everybody. And, you know, I mean, it's just it's just fascinating. So many different pieces that went into, you know, that, 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 that were put together to create this, again, this reality that hopefully now, you know, we're we're breaking out of a little bit, um, you know, both with Me Too and now with with, with Black Lives Matter. And, I mean, you know, if, yeah, yeah. since you brought up Me Too, I mean, I, I mean, I remember it, it's something that was a joke as far as like, oh, the casting couch. Right. I was. Yeah, that I was, was that yeah. was just a way it was in movies. Yeah. It was it was just a way of doing business that no one ever even thought twice about. Like, you know, as I was coming up, um, you know, I'm a man, but I'm a Latino man, so I have a different perspective. But generally speaking, I heard those stories of the casting yeah. couch. I heard about those things. And it's just like you know, every time I ever do a casting, I was always very, very careful. And always very courteous to everybody who walked in. Actors just get destroyed on these casting calls sometimes. It's uh, horrible. Um, the abuse that they take. Um, not me too abuse, but just verbal abuse as well. But it was just part of the culture. It was ingrained. It's systemic inside right. of Hollywood until finally un- the dam broke. Thank God. Right. Right. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, you needed somebody as <laughs> as just blatantly awful as Harvey Weinstein to be the one that's going to, you know, I mean, I mean, it, it, there were so many others. I mean, Les Moonves, I mean, we could go, we, I'm sure oh, we could the, name names from now list. and forever. But, but it took the same way as, as a horrible way to put it, but the same way with George Floyd, you know, it just took this moment as I can't, was it Will Smith or who said it's not like it's not like there's more it's not like there's more racism is that they're more filming of it you know it hasn't gotten yeah worse. it's not yeah it hasn't gotten worse it's just, just there's more cameras there's more eyeballs on it is and what I it. think I think that that's in other words when something breaks in a big way that way it's never that's the thing that that did it by itself it's that that's the last straw right there were thousands and millions of other straws that one is just the last one because in you know in both cases they're so incendiary that you know you, you can't you can't look away and and i guess you know the george floyd coming in the midst of the pandemic it was a perfect well, storm right it, right it, it, i mean it was a perfect storm we're all enclosed and i think also there's a there's a point as well where we're all in quarantine and and many many of uh, uh, many um, uh, Americans specifically have lost their jobs, and they. <clears throat> a lot of times we think as a as a country that we're invincible, but the second that this happened, we realized that we weren't, and they're like, oh wait a minute, and we're also a couple of paychecks away from being out right. on the street. So that combination with those images of George Floyd, I think it was just this perfect storm yeah. of stuff going on in the world that just exploded and I, mean, I think you're right because it put the pandemic put everything on pause all the all, it's like we're talking about all the different all the different problems that come together to create something seamlessly like you know the way hollywood was and okay that's not it didn't create it it's a microcosm of it and it was created by all these other things let's say radio and the way women you know were just even their voices and the way women are, are dressed and the way you know, po- politicians come in and the way religions are all, you know, definitely women are always second class citizens. And they were like, all of that came together. But before the pandemic, to deal with any one of them felt like, yeah, but I got to do this. And there were so many bright yep. things con- yep. continually coming at us that nobody could ever as a whole function on any of it. Now, everything's like on pause and it's right there in front of us. And it's, we're going, okay, wait a minute. We're seeing the effects of it and what can we do about it? And I think if anything possibly good comes out of this, it, it will come from that. Um, yeah, I, 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 I agree. I mean, this conversation has definitely taken a, a turn. Um, <laughs> and I think it's actually this this entire episode has been I had a list of about 20 questions. I've asked two of them. Um, and it's and it's and it's fine because I think um you know, we've kind of gone in, in sections of this interview, we've kind of gone inside the writer's brain. 
um, uh, and, and what, and what makes characters and what motivates us. So it's a kind of like, uh, it's almost a therapy session. I think, um, <laughs> I think this episode is, is semi therapy for everyone listening to it to kind of just kind of process, uh, their own, their own world, but also maybe understand. And hopefully I'll put a list of books in the show notes of neuro neuroscience books that I I've read that are amazing and really understand why we do what we do. But because writing and storytelling is just a reflection of life and us trying to process what living is, um, if you understand more about who you are as a human being, you'll be able to write more engaging characters uh, and, and be more emotional characters. Would you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, I think that I think that the key thing when you're writing anything um, you know, as you were saying before, we want to get a message out. And, and the point of stories isn't just to feel – emotion per se, but it's feeling emotion as you're making a particular point. And I think that's what makes storytellers so powerful, whether they're aware of it or not, because, you know, we're affected by stories every minute of every day, whether we know it or not. And usually we don't. Stories change us because stories, when you're it's just a, <laughs> not talking about this movie, but when you're when you're watching a story, it's like a Vulcan mind meld between you and that protagonist. It, it's like they're your avatar within the story. And as mm -hmm. they go through this internal change that we're talking about, in, in other words, a change in, in, in them seeing what makes people tick, you know, a point you're making about human nature, when they have that big aha moment toward the end, again, the, your, your characters, your protagonists, probably all characters, but particularly the protagonist, will have a small aha moment in every scene, because in every scene, they're trying to move that agenda forward. And in every scene, they're going to learn something that's going to change it, not just logistically what they have to do, but sort of internally as to why it matters or why someone's doing what they're doing that perhaps forces them to reevaluate their plan or change it. So they have a small aha moment, a small change in every scene. But when they get to that big one at the end, and now suddenly they look back to the beginning and they see things differently. Again, like we we're saying before, story makes the unconscious conscious. And at the end, you're questioning a misbelief. And at the end, that misbelief comes up and you realize it for what it is. Because misbeliefs we don't think they're misbeliefs we think they're true and we we're very happy to have learned them at a very early age but at the end of the story you're realizing wait a minute you know as the end of die hard he realizes how much she means to him he realizes that he doesn't have to be this macho guy and you know wherever you go there you are he doesn't have to even necessarily stay in new york he could, have, he could come out to la with her and when he realizes that that's what gives him the courage to then go and you know, because it's right before that scene where he's talking to Reginald Bell Johnson. He's like, I got a bad, you know, got a bad feeling. I don't think I'm going to make it. You know, he goes, when all this is over, I want you to find my wife. Don't ask me how. By then you'll know. And tell her, you know, you heard me say I love you a thousand times. You never heard me say I'm sorry. And like mm -hmm. at that moment, we've watched him build to that. And that's what gives him, again, the, the courage to go forward and to, you know, to kill all the bad guys, of course, because we're all so excited about that. But it's that change that we come for. And when you're writing, that's where your power is. How do you want to change how your viewer sees the world? Because you will, whether you want to or not, even if you're writing, you know, and, and I'm with the even, I don't mean it though, but if you're writing an action movie, they're going to come out changed. They're going to come out seeing the world a little bit differently. And that's what gives you, that's, that's why writers are the most powerful people on the planet. Uh, do do you agree um, with when you, with villains that have like I think all great villains have a particular perspective on on life in the sense that the the mustache twisting villain is so one dimensional and and, yeah, and, and doesn't it doesn't work but when you have a villain who has he has a point of view. His point of view could be so off park, like, you know, perfect example. Uh, and I know you haven't seen um, the, the Avengers, but Thanos, Thanos is, you know, this monstrous, you know, foe. But just so you know, his perspective is that he wants to um, he, when he was younger, there was a lot of famine and, and he had a lot of issues on his planet where he didn't have enough. So he came up with the idea, well, well, the only way we're going to survive, this planet's going to survive, is if half of us are killed off. And it's a very scientific way of looking at things, just a very pragmatic, like, look, if this planet can't support all of us, so half of us have to go. And because he was ostracized for that, uh, for yeah. obvious reasons, he went <laughs> off, came back, did it anyway – and his goal to get the gauntlet of power is to be able to snap his fingers and do it to the entire universe. 
Yes, a hundred percent. And that's his perspective. Right. So it, yes. it, it's a horrible perspective. Right. But he's actually trying to do good in some way, even though it's horrible. <laughs> exactly, because everybody thinks they're doing something for the good. Right. I mean, absolutely. And also, also, if you just have a what and you don't have a why, then the only way you can fight something is just to, to like a zombie, right? You could just kill it because there's nothing behind a zombie other than it's going to come at you and either it's kill or be killed. Villains are are not the least bit interesting if they're just snidely whiplash, you know, black and white at the end of the day. If you look even at Darth Vader, you know, I mean, his, he, what he wanted at, at the end in the, you know, the, the second movie, I mean, he's What's standing up to the actual, whoever, I can't remember what the main bad guy who rarely see. Um, that would be the emperor. Right. The emperor who wants him to kill Luke Skywalker. And he's like, no, 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 I can convince him not to. And the reason he wants to convince him is because he's his son and he's sure he can kind of bring him over to the dark side. That's why we care, you know, on that, on that level. And also if there isn't some reason why, because we come for why, I mean, again, biggest point is we don't come for what someone does. We come for why they do it. Doesn't mean what they're doing, like you said, is right, but we go, oh, it's not just that they're an evil person who wants to kill people for the pleasure of killing people. There's, there's a reason behind it. That's really Back interesting. Yeah. And also, if there's a reason behind it with some villains, it means they're capable of change. They might not be capable of it, but, but you could see how you could change them. You could see maybe there is some hope. Because, again, with a snidely whiplash, you know, just completely black, you know, I think he's like, completely bad guy who's got no, you know. If you're, Twisting thinking about the mustache, yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's, there's no way that you can, there's nothing, there's, there, you've got no hope. It's just, it's just kill him or, you know, or that's the end of it. Way more interesting if there's some, or if there's some, the other good part about that is that if you give them some humanity, like what you were saying about Thanos, you know, if, for instance, we'd seen a moment where he, you know, and maybe we did, I don't know, you can you tell did. me. You did, you did. But, you know, but when he's a kid yep. and he and he wants to and he wholeheartedly believes it's good and he gets slammed, you can have empathy for him. I mean, you're going to go, oh, my God, that poor kid. He didn't mean to. He didn't know it was that. And look, now he's being treated so horribly. I would feel bad, too. And well, yeah, that- it's, the, it's the whole Loki Thor uh, scenario where Loki was the main villain of the first Avengers. And it's, he's, he just wants his father's love. Because Thor took all that love and his, and he was his favorite, so that's why he wants to bring pain to Thor. But yet he still loves Thor because he's his brother in some weird way. But he's always trying to to kill him or screw him over. But yet when when the fit hits the Shan, he's there for him. Like, oh wait a minute, I'm the only one who's allowed to kill my brother. No one else is allowed to kill my brother. <laughs> And here's one other thing that writers can really think about, which is things only have meaning in life, in life as in literature, if they cost something. Yes. And what you just outlined was the cost. I want to kill this guy, but he's my brother. I love him. What am I going to do? You know, I mean, when you think about the Godfather, it's exactly that coming in, you know, the original, the the first Godfather, there's Michael, who's like, I want to leave the family business, you know, and meaning he wants to do something good. He's idealistic. It's not like he wants to, you know, leave the Corleones and start the Sopranos. He wants to do something like that, but his loyalty to the family. But what's going on with the family? What's he going to do? And that's the cost. You're looking, sometimes I call it, and I don't like using this word because it sounds uh, the word being moral, like the moral crux. Here's what I want. Here's what it's going to cost me. And that's what, with every character, this is what I want. This is what it's going to cost me. Can I get it? Can I give this thing up in order to get this other thing that I want? And we want to watch that struggle all the way through. Otherwise, it's it's flat and cardboard. They're just going to do what they're going to do. And you don't need to watch anymore because there's nothing that can surprise you. Snidely Whiplash is always going to do what he's going to do. So, you know, what difference does it make? You got nothing to learn there. Yeah, if he's a bad guy who's just doing bad things for the sake of being a bad guy, then who cares? Right, you Which know. nobody does anyway. There is no such thing as that. There's always a reason. That's There's You're no absolutely problem. right. There, 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 if you're a human being and you're doing bad, it's because something happened to you in in your past that yeah. that is, is spawned this in one way, yeah. shape, or form. I, you but, know. Even psychopaths, in the sense that they say there are a lot of people who are, yeah, I guess, you know, if you do the, the brain scan or whatever, have mm-hmm. whatever you have that makes you a psychopath, but not all of them turn into, you know, killers. Something needs to happen that triggers that part of it. Right. They're not born. They're not born. You know, you're not, their psychopaths aren't born. They're made. 
Right. Well, but but there is yes, it's psychopathic behavior. I think on that level is yeah. triggered. But psycho but psychopathy is a is a you know um, is is a is a brain anomaly. Co- correct. But there's something that triggers that, and yeah. it could. It, yeah. I guess you could kind of. It's a it's a, it's the degree of psychopath. So you could. <laughs> And, and what, I love this conversation. This is fantastic. So if you only kill one person or you can kill a million people, that's a different level of psychopath. Very true. Very true. <laughs> this is horrible. Please forgive me, everyone listening. But it was just an example. <laughs> but listen, I, uh, Lisa, we could keep talking for at least another two hours, I'm sure. But I'm gonna uh, now I'm going to ask you uh, questions uh, that I ask all my guests. Um, what are three screenplays every screenwriter should read? Oh, that's a tough one. I don't know. I don't know that I could. I, I'm really bad at answering stuff off the top of my head. Um, I don't think I could answer because I would have to go back and think, what movies do I love, and then why, and then <laughs> I, any like, three three films that just pop into your head. Well, the movies that I love. I mean, and most of the movies that I love, I think are are. I can't think of anything current off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Um, I love, um, I love the apartment, the, you know, Fantastic. Jack Lemmon, Lee McLean movie. I think that is absolutely positively one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, God, in other movies, I'm trying to think of movies I love, but that I wouldn't really recommend writing the screenplays because they're just weird movies on one level. Um, a, a screenplay, I, 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 I can't, uh, shoot. It's fine. It's fine. I don't know if I'll be able to the, ap- come up the apartment. It is. Um, now, what advice would you give a screenwriter trying to break into the business today? That's a really hard one because it's hard. I mean, <laughs> don't sugarcoat it, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so hard. Um, I think just just read a lot, write a lot. You know, watch the movies that you like. Really dive into. I, I would say, do not use the story structure books. Like, really, do not. Um, I think really dive into story. I think any kind of any kind of job you could get, if there's anything you can do at any to know people, because I think that it that you know this is a business where it's who you know, in a big way. If you can get a job as a reader anywhere, if you can read for anybody, if you can offer to read for someone, I think that really really helps because then you'll be able to see what's out there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would think it was that and just, you know, just, just, just keep writing. Um, now what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the, in the industry or in life? Ooh, (laughs) (laughs) lesson. I don't, um, I don't, the longest to learn, um, hmm. I don't know. I mean, I don't know because it sounds like, I mean, there are two different ways to answer that question. One would be like some, some personal thing that you've gone through so much experience and you sure. finally get it. And, mm-hmm. and that might be for me, for me, it might be setting up boundaries. I'm really bad at that. It's okay. only that I'm learning to actual set up time boundaries and value what I do. And that's a strange thing when you do something like what I do, because what I do is I work with writers. Mm-hmm. Um, I spend, it's part of the reason why the, you know, being, being locked down is my normal life because I literally probably spend somewhere between four and seven hours a day, um, on the phone with writers. That's what I do. And I love it, but, but it could be, it could be hard to go, okay, you've sent me too much. You've sent me too much for what we've contracted for. So, so putting up boundaries like that or, or keeping the phone calls to a normal speed, which is my fault, not anybody else's because I love to talk. So it's that both setting up boundaries with other people and, and setting them up for myself, which is way harder. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. And, I, and, and you also wrote uh, a couple of great books, Story Genius and Wired for Story, which I highly recommend um, for people to, to uh, pick up. I'll have those links in the show notes. Uh, where else can people find you and, and uh, if they want to get in contact with you and, and work with um, you? Yeah, you can find, if you want to work with me personally, um, my website, which is wiredforstory.com. Uh, I also have several classes on uh, Creative Live, uh, which is a, a, an education platform. And I actually also have a class on lynda.com, which I think is now LinkedIn Learning. But uh, anyway, I, I'm all over the place. 
Lisa, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I, I really, it, it, it took, the conversation has gone into directions I did not anticipate, which is always a great, great interview when I am able to not see what's coming. Um, I actually like the unknown when yeah, I do interviews. <laughs> no lions, we ran around all those corners and no lions ate us. <laughs> no lions ate us. We are all still here. Thank God. So Lisa, thank you so much for being on the show and dropping those knowledge bombs on the tribe. So thank you. My pleasure. Take care. I want to thank Lisa for coming on the show and dropping those knowledge bombs on the tribe. Thank you so much, Lisa, for your insight into the ever complicated and deep subject of story. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including links to her courses and her books, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 077. And guys, if you haven't already and you are capable of doing so, I have set up a link to help people struggling with food insecurity due to the coronavirus at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash help. And whatever you can give can help a lot of people out there struggling right now because of this COVID-19 pandemic. And the link goes to Feed America. So again, once more time, that link is IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash help. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you guys are doing very well hanging in there in this crazy upside down world that we're living in right now. And I hope you're writing a lot. So as always, keep on writing no matter what. Be safe and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at BulletproofScreenwriting.tv. 